Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to the first LID seminar for the year. Uh, my name is Lincoln Humphreys, and I'm filling in for Chris Bigby, who is quite busy at the moment getting organized for tomorrow's book launch and interviewing people. So I'll be filling in for the first part of the seminar, and then uh, Pro Professor Teresa Iacono will be running uh, today's LID seminar. Um, so we've got a special presentation to start off the year. This afternoon, we have three presenters, two of whom are graduates of the Masters of Disability Practice. Um, so for the Masters, the students uh, completed a thesis and they're both presenting uh, their thesis, the, uh, the findings from that, uh, sort of a summary of what they produced from their thesis. And then finally, I'll be uh, the third speaker. So the format for Today's seminar is that each presenter will speak for about 20 to 30 minutes. And then after each speaker, there'll be time to ask questions. Um, and uh, we will be finishing up around five o'clock. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Stephen Lowe, who is presenting on restrictive practices. Take it away, Stephen. My thesis was on restrictive practices as a last resort. A bit of background as to why I have been lucky enough to work alongside people with intellectual disability, uh, starting as a support worker back in 1990. And I've been involved in uh, working with people who communicate in ways that challenge others and uh, how we respond to that ever since in, in a variety of roles, both as, as a support worker, as an authorised program officer, as someone who's written behaviour support plans, as someone who's trained others to use them. Um, my motivation was for the last 30 something years, we are still having the same conversations and I wanted to get deeper into why. So to start with, uh, let's define challenging behaviour. Around 450,000 Australians live with an intellectual disability and at any one time, 10 to 15% of those will be labelled as communicating with challenging behaviours. Challenging behaviours as defined by Hasiotis and Ruder in 2022 are learned responses to intrinsic and extrinsic interactions. They can become a stigmatising, reputation-forming long-term condition and can increase the likelihood of low self-esteem, community exclusion, according to AL et al. in 2016, and are likely to lead to poor health, increased hospitalisations and increased psychotropic medications. One of the ways in which we respond to challenging behaviour, and I should say that I am using the term challenging behaviour as it is the most commonly used in academic literature, uh, recognising that there are a number of other terms such as um, behaviours that challenge, uh, behaviours of concern, and recognising that behaviour is communication. So one of the um, responses to challenging behaviour is positive behaviour support. It's been defined most notably by Carr et al. in 2002 as an applied science which utilises educative responses and is aligned to the personal and, and environment, er, environmental considerations for, for the individual. Uh, Gore in 2013 described four elements of positive behaviour support as assessing the broader context and environments in which the person utilises the behaviour, B, with all stakeholders associated with it, to jointly design, apply and review an individually specific and sustainable proactive response, and I think jointly de design is really important, which improves the quality of life of the person displaying the behaviours. Therefore, positive behaviour support should not only result in a valued and measurable improvement in a person's quality of life, but also in reducing or removing challenging behaviours. Another way we respond to someone who is communicating with us in a way that we find challenging is by implementing a restrictive practice. 
In Australia, restrictive interventions are applied to people with a disability who are NDIS participants and can only be done so as a last resort. And this use must be registered with and reported to the NDIS Quality and Safeguard Commission. The term last resort implies that other least, less restrictive options, such as beh positive behaviour support strategies, which include active listening, diversions and non-aversive responses, have been applied but have not removed the risk of harm. Restrictive practices have been recorded as causing serious physical injury and psychological harm, negatively impacting on the effectiveness and power balances of relationships between the person with a disability and those working alongside them, and increasing the person's dependency and helplessness. And this was re recorded by the Royal Commission of Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability in their issues paper on restrictive practices released in 2020. As part of their look into restrictive practices, the Disability Royal Commission commissioned two research papers into restrictive interventions and restrictive restrictive practices. These were both published in 2023. There are potentially several reasons for the sustained prevalence of challenging behaviours, including a person's accommodation setting, their reliance on or exposure to paid staff, the level of restrictiveness of the rules present in their home and social environments and settings. In relation to research about people with an intellectual disability who receive restrictive interventions, one of the papers commissioned by the Disability Royal Commission argues that there are some evidence gaps and evidence reportedly comes mainly from mental health settings rather than the full range of disability service settings and research about the lived experience of people with intellectual disability is particularly sparse. Uh, a second, the, the second paper also notes that in relation to alternatives to restrictive practices such as positive behaviour support, uh, the evidence has been inconclusive. Now, in relation to the numbers on the screen, uh, the same period last of, of the year 2022 was 11,165 approved restrictive interventions and 4,161 unapproved, so both figures were higher. Policy. There's also the new Commonwealth Act on Disability, which reinforces that people with an intellectual disability should receive services in the least restrictive way, which does not impact on their freedom. So there has been a brand new piece of federal legislation that came into effect on the 1st of January, as I'm sure you're all aware, that reinforces this policy stance. Research questions. These questions were designed to collate, to collect and collate the collective experiences of all of the stakeholders involved in restrictive practices. That is, people with intellectual disability who receive restrictive practices, families, informal carers and support workers who might implement restrictive practices, positive behaviour support practitioners and other allied health professionals, service managers, doctors, psychiatrists. I hope that their insight might shed light on why after almost 40 years since the introduction of positive behaviour support, 17 years since the introduction of the United Nations Convention of Rights of People with Disability, we are still relying on restrictive practices. The aims of this study were to review the perspectives and experiences of multiple stakeholders of restrictive practices to see if we could understand what is effective when using restrictive practices in the moment. Now, in the moment, I defined as for the person receiving or the person implementing the practice, the moment that that happened, for people such as positive behaviour support practitioners and doctors, the moment is defined as the moment that they chose to approve or design the use of a restrictive practice on another individual. The, effect, the word effective in what is effective when using restrictive practices in the moment, effective I defined as minimising harmful effects of restrictive interventions at the point of their use. 
research protocols. So a systematic review of published literature from six academic databases for search for peer-reviewed quantitative and qualitative studies from any country written in English and published in academic journals between 2005 and 2023. I chose 2005 as just a couple of years before the introduction of the UNCRPD to, to monitor the implementation of it and, and the years since. Studies were excluded if uh, the participants included people challenging behaviours who have primary disabilities other than intellectual, such as autism or psychiatric, uh, people who lived in clinical, correctional or inpatient or institutional settings, including locked wards, correctional centres and hospitals, uh, and children. Search results, 587 studies were found through the databases after the removal of almost 50 duplicates, uh, sc screening of titles and abstracts removed 414 studies, uh, 82 full texts were reviewed and 30 studies were selected and included. The characteristics of the 30 studies 13 from the United Kingdom, seven from the Netherlands, four from Australia, two each from Canada, Belgium and Sweden, and one from the United States. All of these countries have signed one or both parts of the UNCRPD and all the developed countries. Uh, the studies, there were significantly, significantly more studies published in, in the last five or 10 years than say from 2005 to 2015, certainly indicating a, a renewed academic interest in this area. 20 of the studies were qualitative, six were mixed methods and four were quantitative, so 20 were qualitative. I think it's quite interesting that the most studied restraint was chemical um, and the most studied challenging behaviour was physical aggression. After looking at these results, the research question, I came up with three research questions. Uh, the research questions were We were designed to make sure that we gathered people's, as we went through before, get, gathered people's perspectives. Um, what's really interesting is that with the first research question, there were two very clear themes. Uh, these were consistent across all studies and consistent across countries of publication and whether they were uh, published earlier in, in the, the research period between 2005 to 2023 or later. Uh, the first theme from studies which included people with an intellectual disability and 14 of the studies uh, included, uh, covered this question. Many participants with an intellectual disability did not equate receiving a restrictive intervention with their antecedent challenging behaviour. They didn't always know why this was happening to them. They also didn't always, they also reported that they didn't know why it stopped. Now, others would say that the restrictive intervention stops when the challenging behaviour ceases, but that link was not always made by the person receiving the restrictive intervention. Um, a significant number of participants did not know that the reason they were being restrained was to keep other people safe. Applying a restrictive intervention primarily for the safety of others was a theme identified by numerous studies. Some participants didn't realise environmental restraints were restrictive interventions. They just thought they were house rules. I'm not allowed to go in that room. That door has to remain locked because mum said or the worker said or this is just what the organisation's rules are. So they didn't realise. So they had, they had no control over their environmental setting. It was a house rule, rule imposed on them. Many people did not realise that they were taking a, a pill the doctor told them to take 
and that what the pill does for their behaviors or their bodies or they, they were taking a pill because the doctor told them to so again they weren't making an informed they, they were not participating or controlling their lives in in, in any in any informed way Numerous participants in these studies reported that restrictive interventions they received was because a worker wanted to exert control over them. One participant in one study asserted that he reckoned some of the staff here might seclude people just to prove they're in charge. The second theme leads on from that quote, and that is restrictive interventions elicit negative emotional and physical responses. Participants reported experiencing physical pain, psychological harm, and discomfort when receiving physical restraints. Uh, they reported that different support workers will implement restrictive interventions at different times, different stages, and in different ways, and this unpredictability created further anxiety. The anxiety was increased also, and they didn't know the worker very well. Participants reported difficulty in coping with the negative emotions, pain, and psychological harm. Coping mechanisms that people did use uh, were varied and people would usually come up with them themselves. They weren't necessarily trained or taught in them. Throughout all of the reviewed research, there is a clear sense of participants' disempowerment along with reports that they are often treated unfairly and unkindly. Research question two, what is really interesting about this is that exactly the same two themes occurred. They are about safety and control, and they elicit negative emotional and physical responses. So both the people receiving them and the people implementing these procedures are not sure what else to do, but they don't like doing it. Uh, across several studies, there were consistent findings about the circumstances leading up to the moment supporting support workers decide to apply a restraint, including keeping other clients safe. Support workers did note that they know they don't always know when to apply a restrictive intervention, and they may learn from others informally by watching other workers or more experienced workers. Um, but sometimes, it is up to them and their judgment, and they felt that this was quite a worrisome. This this would add to their anxiety as to whether they were actually choosing to implement the restrictive intervention at the right time and in the right way. The last question, because I'm running out of time, I should have looked at my clock earlier. Uh, research question three, what is effective when using restrictive practices in the moment? Of all of the studies, I think the consistency in response here, the three themes were absolutely consistent, whether they were coming from a psychiatrist, a manager, a support worker, or a person living with an intellectual disability. The parents reported the importance of being listened to. People with the intellectual disability said if we were listened to and taken for a walk first, this we might be diverted. Support workers wanted to feel part of a consistent and effective team. Behaviour support practitioners um, and psychiatrists and doctors felt a bit helpless around the fact that they feel that people don't know how to implement their behaviour support plans or, or, or to support people in a more uh, positive, less restrictive manner. The right environment around people with intellectual disabilities having more say more autonomy in the environment and the circumstances that they live in and find themselves in. Training was really interesting. Most of the training study was around mindfulness and emotional regulation. Uh, and the findings were clear that if all parties have some support in how to regulate their emotions, restrictive interventions are used less frequently and are seen as less traumatic. Uh, training and support wanted was around coaching, mentoring, peer networking. For parents, people with intellectual disabilities and support workers, all stakeholders wanted more training, not just support workers. And I think that looking at training for all stakeholders, um, 
may be quite a, a beneficial move. I've touched on some of the discussion points. Factors identified as effective in the moment when implementing restrictive practices included training, collaboration, consistency, person-centered environments, trustful established relationships, a multi-stakeholder proactive approach, the importance of emotional regulation, the awareness of others, of self and others. Although the studies on mindfulness have contributed to understanding the issue of emotional regulation, there seems to be a dearth of research on how to implement a team approach in the right environment. Active support springs to mind. Uh, the fact that I did not find any studies, any recent studies on the relationship between active support and positive behaviour support really surprised me. Other future research areas. As the studies found and reviewed in this systematic review of primarily qualitative, it could be timely for hypothesis-driven research to study recorded instances of successful replacement of challenging behaviours and successful reduction of restrictive interventions. This could be possible in Australia, where all NDIS prov service providers who implement restrictive interventions register each occurrence of an intervention with the Central National Regulator, the Quality Safeguards Commission, for each participant. So we've theoretically got some data that shows that some people might, if, if there's any of that data that shows people are getting less restrictive practices, be great to, to study that and to find out why. I think studies on the relationship between active support and positive behaviour support could be a fruitful area. Um, further study within Australia in environmental restraints may well be justified, as would further studies including parents, managers and doctors. And that is that. All right, well, thank you very much, Steve, for that excellent presentation. Up next, we have Emily Daniels, who is presenting on local area coordinators. Over to you, Emily. Thank you, Lincoln. Can I just check that you can see my screen there and hear me okay? Yes, everything's good, ready to go. Thank you. Uh, first off, I'm coming to you today from Tasmania, so I'd just like to acknowledge the Muwanina people who are the traditional custodians of the land Nipaluna. And also uh, a disclaimer up front, I'm just uh, in the process of recovery from a very nasty lurgy, so uh, I have fingers crossed that I will get through this without too much coughing or nose blowing, but uh, forgive me if that becomes an issue. Uh, so, yeah, last year I uh, completed the Masters of Disability Practice. I've worked in the disability sector for nearly 35 years and I thought, you know, how much more did I really have to learn? And what I found out was I had a lot to learn and it, it was just a fantastic uh, course that opened my eyes to a whole lot of things I hadn't really thought about. So a uh, big thank you to the to the team at La Trobe and it was a wonderful course. So uh, thank you for the opportunity today to talk about my research thesis, which looked at um, exploring principles that drive the practice of local area coordination. So local area coordination or LAC is a model of support, which generally speaking, aims at improving the lives of people with disability by facilitating and strengthening connections with informal support networks, community and mainstream supports and disability services. The practice of LAC began in the 1980s in Western Australia, and it's now been adopted in Great Britain, Canada, New Zealand and Singapore. And local area coordinators are the individuals who are employed to support people with disabilities their families and their communities to achieve goals and build capacity using the LAC model. So the research problem had a focus on local area coordination delivered specifically in Great Britain and Australia. 
and compared the principles that drive the practice for the local, co um, local area coordinators themselves. The way that LAC is delivered in Australia has undergone a huge change since the introduction of the National Disability Insurance Scheme in 2013. So LAC in Australia is an integral component of the NDIS with local area coordinators embedded into the participant pathway to support community connections and facilitate linkages to community and mainstream services. Since the introduction of the NDIS, uh, the role of local area coordinators in Australia has undergone a shift in focus and local area coordinators have become more involved in gathering information required to build funded plans and supporting people to connect with specialised services to use their funds. And that's really different to the way that LAC is delivered in Great Britain, where the original principles of LAC has still practised. So the aims of the project were to examine what local area coordinators believe um, to be their guiding principles that uh, guide their practice when they're delivering local area coordination. To look at these principles and compare them for local area coordinators who are working in Great Britain and working in Australia and to see if any further research might be warranted. So the methodology that I used to explore that research question, this was a very small uh, scale qualitative, qualitative research study. I recruited local area coordinators based in Australia and Great Britain. And I did that uh, by sending an expression of interest via email. And that was sent out by the local area coordinators, direct uh, employers. <laughs> in Australia, the local area coordinators were recruited from a Partners in the Community program. So Partners in the Community are commissioned by the NDIA uh, across all of Australia. Different organisations are commissioned to support the rollout of the NDIS and support participants, support access requests, that sort of thing. In Great Britain, uh, the recruitment was done through the LAC network. That's sort of an overarching body that um, oversees LAC in the various counties and regions and areas in the UK. So after sending out the expression of interest emails, I actually received more um, interest than what I needed for the number of people that I was hoping to interview. So that was uh, very fortuitous. I didn't have to chase people or wait a long time uh, to get participants in the study. I then organised teams meetings with those participants and I conducted semi-structured interviews on an individual basis. The interviews lasted between about 45 minutes to an hour each. And the interviews were recorded and transcribed with the participants' consent. Uh, the interviews with the LACs from Great Britain were conducted in the evening to compensate for the time difference, uh, but I got them all done within about two weeks. And six LACs were interviewed in total, three being from Great Britain and three being from Australia. So following all of the interviews, it was time to start looking at those transcripts and looking at that data and starting the data analysis. So the transcripts from the interviews were uploaded into a software package called NVivo, uh, which is designed to support analysis of qualitative or mixed methods research. And this was just a revolutionary way of, of, of doing the coding and doing this data analysis rather than having you know, walls full of sticky notes and moving things around and doing it that way. So I was very appreciative of being introduced to that software. Uh, so the files were coded using the NVivo software. I went through every single transcript line by line and coded the uh, data and the information that was in there from those interviews. At the end of that, I ended up with 39 codes being identified. Following that, I uh, started doing a thematic analysis of those codes using um, a methodology described by Braun and Clark. So I read each transcript multiple times, I rewatched the videos, and uh, after the 39 codes were identified, I then studied those codes to look for patterns and themes 
uh, that were recurring in the data. And at the conclusion of that thematic analysis, came up with three themes um, of principles that the local area coordinators reported as being important and seven sub themes that underpin those overarching themes. So as I said, three themes were identified and seven uh, sub themes. The sub themes really are around factors that influence the local area coordinator's ability in practice to hold true to the principles that they identified as important. So the three um, principles that were identified were being person-centred, using communication and capacity building. And then there's seven sub themes, you can see that underpin each of those. So the LACs from Great Britain and Australia both spoke about uh, person-centred principles guiding their practice. And um, the sub themes under that were relationships being outcomes versus outputs driven and the level of autonomy the local area coordinators have in doing their job. Uh, providing good communication, which was honest and transparent as well as responsive, was identified as an essential principle of LAC in both Great Britain and Australia. Sub themes identified here were the need to interpret information for people that uh, the LAC support, the need to listen with empathy and hear people's stories, and to support people to navigate systems. And the last principle uh, theme identified was that of capacity building. And both groups of LAC saw that community connections was a very important part of their practice. And LACs from Great Britain had a very big focus on the principle of natural authority. So in the next few slides, we'll just have a look at um, those three themes in a little bit more detail. So the first principle being person-centered. LACs from uh, both groups, saw that building trust and relationships was absolutely vital uh, to being a effective local area um, coordinator. However, the amount of people assigned to a local area, um, which in this case I just called a caseload, really varied uh, between Great Britain and Australia and had a big impact on the way that LACs reported that they could build those relationships and rapport. So in Great Britain, uh, the average caseload reported for an LAC was 45 people, whereas in Australia, the LACs reported that it was around 190 people assigned to each local area coordinator. Uh, interestingly, the LACs in both Great Britain and Australia reported that they thought the caseloads were too high. So <laughs> even in uh, Great Britain, where you've got you know, far less um, people assigned, they still felt that that was too high to really do their jobs well. And in Australia, uh, unanimously, the LACs reported that the caseload was seen as a substantial barrier to really forming relationships and building rapport. Uh, so the next sub theme here was outcomes and outputs. Australian LACs reported that they have KPIs that they have to work to and that they're very outputs focused. They include things like how many days for participants gaining access to the scheme to when they have their first meeting is measured, uh, the percent of plans that have been submitted on time is measured, how much is it over an expected budget in a plan, things like that. So very outputs focused KPIs um, are what the LACs in Australia are measured against. The LACs from Great Britain stated that they have no KPIs that they have to meet and that they are really far more focused on the outcomes uh, for the individuals that they're working with and, and the change over time that those individuals are reporting. Uh, the final one here is um, looking at autonomy. Uh, again, huge differences between Great Britain and Australia. Uh, Great Britain LACs reported a very high level of autonomy and flexibility in their day-to-day -day working. They choose who they support, what groups they attend, how they make connections. Basically, every day they decide, um, you know, what, what they're going to do and where they'll make the most value. In the NDIS context in Australia, uh, there's steps that have to be completed, which follow a very linear pathway when you're working with a participant. 
and the steps are all recorded and completed in the client management system PACE, which is designed and owned by the NDAA. So very process driven um, in comparison to the way that the LACs in Great Britain report that they work. So the second principle of communication, we had two sub-themes. The first one um, was looking at uh, listening and both groups spoke about listening, about the need to listen and absolutely emphasise the need for it to be done in a respectful way and with uh, empathy and compassion. System navigation, both groups stated um, that supporting people to navigate systems was a big part of their role. In Australia, it was largely related to people getting access to the scheme and then working through the planning process. Whereas in Great Britain, it was more uh, focused on health, education, mental health systems, that sort of thing. Um, in Australia, getting funding in an NDIS plan has become part of a function of the LAC role. And the LACs themselves reported that that has compromised uh, their ability to practice in line with the true LAC principles that were um, identified back in the 1980s. In Great Britain, the LAC role um, doesn't support people at all to access funding, and so the focus has remained uh, far more on community connections. And uh, the last principle that I'm going to talk about uh, that I identified was the capacity building one. So um, self-determination, all the LACs interviewed from Great Britain uh, used the words natural authority, all of them, whereas in Australia, um, nobody used that term. So natural authority is something which is very um, well understood and thought about in Great Britain, but not necessarily in Australia. But in Australia, um, the LACs absolutely used the words of, of choice and control and they um, had, had a focus on building independence and supporting people to learn to do things for themselves. And uh, the last one here was looking at community connection. So in Australia, the lack of suitable and available mainstream supports in communities was reported to be a major issue by all of the LACs interviewed. Uh, in Great Britain, the focus was more on the health services and the wait lists um, that people encounter there. It was only the LACs from Great Britain who used the term citizenship, which was interesting. None of the Australian LACs used those terms, whereas every LAC in Great Britain used the term citizenship. Uh, and both locations talked about the importance of inclusive communities. But the LACs in Great Britain talked about the time that they were um, able to dedicate just to getting to know their communities and becoming very well known in their communities and time that they could just spend before they even started the local area coordination work with individuals. They could spend a lot of time in their communities getting to know them and getting um, the communities to know who they were. And people in Australia certainly didn't feel that they had uh, similar resources of time to be able to do that. So overall, at the end of all of that, uh, the general findings that uh, this research uncovered was that LAC is practised very differently in Great Britain than it is in Australia. LAC in Australia under the NDIS has become far more focused on funded plans uh, with much higher caseloads, KPIs, and less of a focus on, on that true um, community connection that they spoke about in uh, Great Britain. LACs in Great Britain have autonomy in how they work. In Australia, the requirements are very much determined by NDIS processes. Uh, both the groups reported that relationships are vital, the bureaucratic language is really challenging for people, there's a lack of mainstream services and they all reported, regardless of where they work, that systems can be very difficult to navigate and that that's part of their role as an LAC. So some common principles that were highlighted by both groups as being absolutely integral to the, to the principles that LACs hold uh, dear to their hearts to, to drive their practice were uh, communicating in a transparent and responsive manner, building strong relationships that lead to a level of trust, 
listening in a manner that conveys respect and empathy, taking time to really listen to people's stories and working from a place of fairness and equity. Being person-centred was something that every single LAC spoke about and the importance of doing with a person or walking beside a person rather than doing for a person and providing information in a manner that's clear and accessible was also seen as very important. Obviously, there were limitations to this study. It was a very small sample size, only interviewing six LACs, and certainly the views of those six LACs can't be assumed to be reflective of all of LACs working in Australia or Great Britain. In Australia, the LACs were all recruited from one partner organisation, and, you know, that might affect their responses um, if you think about the training that that specific organisation has offered, the leadership, the team culture. So, again, it can't be assumed that um, the LACs from that partner organisation would say the same things as LACs from another partner organisation. And all of these limitations could really be addressed with further research using a bigger sample size and obviously including participants from multiple organisations. So finally, in conclusion, um, there, as, as I've said, there are significant differences in the way the LAC is delivered in Australia and Great Britain. Caseloads and the level of autonomy to perform LAC were reported as being the significant variations between the two groups. And the introduction of the NDIS has definitely impacted the way that local area coordination um, is delivered in Australia since 2013. So uh, interestingly, despite all of these differences, despite all of the um, different things that affect the way that LACs practice in Australia and Great Britain, Despite all of that, the principles reported by the LACs as being important to them and the things that they hold to drive their practice were surprisingly similar. So all of the LACs interviewed um, find that the joy in their work comes from the people they work with, whether that's uh, the people in their teams that they work with, their colleagues, or the people who they're supporting out in the communities or community groups themselves, all of them said, that they keep doing their job because they just love working with the people they work with. They're very motivated by seeing positive change over time. And that uh, relates back to listening to people's stories, seeing where somebody is when they start with them and then seeing what they've achieved, uh, you know, sort of towards the end of the journey. So they're all motivated by that. And all of the LACs are driven by desire to create communities where people with disabilities have the same rights as everyone else, inclusive communities, welcoming places, uh, places that absolutely value people with disability as true citizens, and um, that individuals can strive for a better life with support of a local area coordinator. So uh, thank you for that. That is the end of my presentation. All right, well, welcome back everyone. I hope everyone is back. Uh, I am Teresa Icano, and um, in case you're wondering who that person was nodding away, um, while we had those excellent presentations by Steve and Emily, um, I am a member of LIDS, and um, it's my pleasure, <clears throat> my craggy voice, to introduce um, Lincoln, who will talk about active his active support measure, a multi-level exploratory factor analysis don't be put off it's really exciting <laughs> and nobody knows this type of analysis better than than Lincoln and um there have been a lot of questions and comments about active support so I think this is really a nice follow-on from the other two presentations so uh same deal as before pop your questions onto the Q&A um and at the end of the presentation uh we'll, Lincoln will have time to answer them over to you Lincoln Thanks, Teresa. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is, uh, I'm presenting on a study on the active support measure. Um, so this was a study that I did with uh, collaboration with Chris, Teresa herself, and also Tal. And this research was funded by the NDIS Quality and Safeguard Commission. 
So this is the study uh, and the paper is actually just being recently accepted for publication in the Journal of Intellectual Disability Research. And that paper is actually quite brief. It's only about 4,500 words. I think I could probably read it out within the 30 minute time slot that I've got now. So I'll try and do my best to give a bit of an explanation in terms of uh, the, the background and what was going on in the study and try to interpret what the finding means. And also I'll give a bit of a background about active support, which would hopefully uh, interest the people who had questions about active support in uh, the previous presentations. So here is the a very common definition of active support that you'll find in the literature that comes from Mansell and Beetle Brown, and that is active support is a way of supporting people with intellectual disabilities to engage in meaningful activities and social interaction. So active support is a person-centered practice um, that has been informed by behavior theory. And I'm gonna talk a little bit now about it being informed by behavior theory and um, because that's kind of key to sort of understanding the active support measure or helps to understand the active support measure. So uh, with behavior theory, the focus is on what is observable. So observable behavior, uh, basically what people do and what people can see, it's quite as uh, straightforward as that. And uh, initially active support was informed by applied behavior analysis. Um, so uh, it drew on ideas from applied behavior analysis, such as setting up activities, task analysis, which is breaking an activity in, down into its steps, prompting people, um, you know, which is very similar to uh, assisting, the type of assistance you provide, and then reinforcement. Uh, so giving sort of praise and encouragement after someone has done something. So uh, this is the influence on of behavior theory is quite explicit in one of the first real studies of active support, which uh, was conducted in the 1980s in the UK. It's known as the Andover Project. Um, so this, in this study in the UK, they established small staffed houses of six residents, so essentially group homes. And they had the they wanted to develop these houses as a community. So this was during Gene's yeah, during Gene's institutionalization. Uh, but the idea that people, the residents living in these services, should be provided with opportunities and support to participate in everyday activities at home and in the community. Um, so obviously in institutions and other services, they're finding that people were disengaged a lot. They weren't doing uh, too much activity. They were spending a lot of time waiting, watching, not doing much. Or And then when staff would engage with them, it would only be once they've got the main activities or house activities done for the day and then they'll interact them with sort of like leisure activities and they sort of were like well this isn't uh, the best use of people's time because they're doing a lot of like um, jigsaw puzzles or something like that there should be something better going on so they um, uh, developed when they developed these houses they encouraged all, all the staff who were delivering the services were involving people to participate in meaningful activities interaction so uh, the things around the house shopping in the community all that sort of stuff. And in the develop, uh, for me to um, uh, develop these slides for this presentation, I actually went back and read a bit of the, the book from the Endover Project called Developing Staffed Houses, and that was published by Jim Mansell, David Fels, and others. And, you know, it's such an incredible book with the ideas that they had in there that, that, that it was so ahead of their time in 1987 to have these ideas and the principles of active support, many of which you can still see today. However, there has been um, some development and evolution over time uh, in terms of active support. It probably isn't quite as strongly attached to applied behavior analysis now. Um, so there's been a few uh, training resources, two of which have been developed in the UK, one at the Welsh Centre, the other at the Tizard Centre, the um, one that probably most people know, which is person-centered active support. And the Tizard Centre person-centered active support uh, was the training that influenced the training that we've developed here at the Living with Dis Leeds, the Living with Disability Research Centre. Um, across the three different types of active support training, they've actually got more in common um, than what they have different. I think the, one of the key differences is that uh, the Tizard Centre approach to active support puts less emphasis on paperwork and monitoring active support compared to the Welsh Centre. 
uh, the, the, the Tis Arts Centre active support is more about active support in the moment um, and engaging people in the moment. But one thing that all these trainings do have common uh, is that it's delivered with a combination of classroom and hands-on coaching. So uh, for us, this typically looks like uh, staff get uh, two-day classroom training and then they get hands-on coaching in their services by a trained coach, um, giving them uh, tips and advice and feedback on how they div delivered support. And that's always been a key component of active support training. So what does active support mean and look like for staff and the people supported? Um, so to do active support, staff put into practice the four essentials of active support. So this is comes from the Tizard Centre training of active support from Jim Ansell and Julie Beagle-Brown. Uh, so in that diagram there, you can see the four essentials of active support. Well, it might be very small on your screen, so I'll read it out. The first essential is every moment has potential. So this is about staff <coughs> recognising that there's many opportunities throughout the day for people to be engaged. Um, so they provide the people they support with opportunities to participate. So this might be in things like um, cooking, uh, cleaning, um, shopping, writing shopping lists, doing washing, all that sort of stuff. So the idea is that as a worker, if you're doing something, you would try and find ways for people to be involved. If someone is, uh, you know, when they make breakfast in the morning, that people are participating. And you do this by breaking the activity into steps. So again, it sort of reflects the task analysis. So the steps of making breakfast or making a cup of coffee is, you know, getting the cup, getting the coffee, getting a spoon, turning on the kettle, and you would be involving people in those steps. And you do that by using grade assistance. So providing the right type and amount of assistance for that person to participate. So it might be um, asking them to get their cup, um, providing them with hand over hand assistance to pour hot water from a kettle, or even just letting, standing back and letting the person get on with the steps that they can do themselves. Let's say getting milk from the fridge. And as a worker, uh, the next, um, essential of active support is maximizing choice and control. So this is providing the person with choice in terms of the activities they participate in and when. So it might be, uh, do you want to have your shower first or you want to make breakfast? And when they're making breakfast, it'd be like, you know, providing choice in terms of what they have and which steps they do. If you would like toast or cereal, would you like to get your bowl, all those sorts of things. And then the fourth essential of active support is little and often. So this is recognizing uh, when a person needs a break. So maybe they've been participating for as long as they want to, and it's okay that they stop and go and do something else and then recognizing when they're ready. And then as a staff member, inviting them back uh, to return to that activity. So um, uh, I'm sure lots of people know about this, but there's a website that we've developed here at Leeds called Skills for Active Support. You can access it at the Every Moment Has Potential website. And so what this means for people who staff support is that rather than them doing nothing, waiting, just sitting or watching, that they are supported by staff to participate in domestic, personal care, leisure and social activities. So I just need a drink to fix my throat. And the idea is that by people being more engaged in meaningful activities and interacting with people, then that contributes to their quality of life. If they're uh, doing the things that they enjoy that provides them fulfillment and purpose, uh, rather than just sitting, waiting, doing nothing for extended periods, uh, then they'll experience a better quality of life. So engagement can be thought of as a building block for quality of life. So what I mean by that is if, um, you know, if your health is important to you, it's part of uh, what gives you good quality of life, then to do that, you may need to exercise. And then to exercise, you have to, uh, participate in something, some form of exercise, you know, running, kicking the ball, lifting the weight. So that bit of engagement is the building block to the thing which then uh, contributes to quality of life. Same if you feel uh, having a job contributes to your quality of life, then you have to do the thing at work that to perform that job. So this is the way that engagement is this, uh, can be seen as a building block for quality of life. So there's been much research into active support. It has being one of the most researched staff practices in supported accommodation services for adults with intellectual disabilities. Um, so since the 1980s, there's been uh, research conducted in the UK. Uh, some key studies were conducted in the 1990s and early 2000s. There's been research in Australia. Uh, I'm sure as many people know that LIDS here has been 
running a longitudinal study into active support for quite some time now. And then there's also been research in New Zealand, Taiwan, USA, and uh, there's been quite a bit of development in Sweden in the past few years. And what these studies point to is that active support is very effective when implemented well. Um, so there was, <laughs> in 20, 2018, Flynn and others conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis of 14 studies into active support. So a meta-analysis meta is a way of taking those, uh, the findings, the statistical findings and uh, summarizing it and seeing what is the effect of active support. So what they found when they examined these uh, different studies is that there's active support results in a significant increase in the amount of time that people are engaged. So people, um, let's say for example, on average may move from being engaged 50% of the time and that increases. So there's sort of a, a significant effect. Uh, this review also found that the, there was a significant increase in the amount of time that people received assistance from staff. And they also found there was a significant increase in the quality of active support, which is the main thing I will be talking about as well. But uh, important to realize is that observation has been frequently used in research of active support for data collection. Uh, I'm gonna sort of have a guess that it probably, it throws back to um, sort of researchers having a um, sort of a behavioral theory approach to understanding um, uh, to doing research, um, to observing people and all those sorts of things. So observation has been the main way in which active support has been uh, researched in uh, services. And the main measure of the quality of active support that has been used is the active support measure. So this is again, an observational measure, which was developed in the 1990s by Jim Mansell and Elliot. So the active support measure comprises 15 items. So there's some example items there on the screen. It's a um, choice of activities, demands presented carefully, tasks appropriately analyzed. So again, it sort of reflects that uh, behavior theory, the early development of active support, grade assistance, another one, sufficient staff contact, interpersonal warmth, and staff work as a team. So they're just some of the examples. And then to rate the items, the researcher um, uses a four point scale where zero is the lowest level of support. And then at the other end, a three reflects good support. So for an example, uh, with the item choice of activities, if staff are providing the person with lots of choice of activities in terms of what they do, when, um, uh, how much of it and all that sort of stuff, then it would be rated a three. But if staff aren't providing the person with any choice, then that would be rated as a zero. This is sort of key to uh, understanding how the active support works. It's completed on the support a person receives. So you're rather than avail evaluating each staff member. So we're not rating, uh, let's say there's two staff, we're not rating each staff on the quality of support they provided to the people supporting. We're in fact rating the support that each resident received from staff. So if there's one staff member on shift, then it's rating, you know, if there's five people, then the ASM gets completed five times for each resident on the support they receive. But if there's two staff, then it's sort of taking a, combination of the support that that person received. And the ASM data is collected based on two hour uh, non-participant observations in services, uh, usually group homes between the hours of 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. for two hours. So it coincides with the use of the EMAC hour, which is an observational measure of engagement. So we will, uh, as a researcher, we will go in, observe um, the people have consented in the study for two hours, collecting data on how much they're engaged and disengaged. And at the end of that, complete the active support measure um, to measure the quality of the support that the person received. So this has been a frequently used research, uh, sorry, a frequently used measure in research, particularly in the UK at the Tizard Centre and at, in Australia here at Leeds. Okay, so using the ASM, it's actually a pretty reliable, um, predictor of uh, outcomes. So what I mean by that is the ASM has been used as an, in the, uh, sorry, as a dependent, independent and dependent variable. So as an independent variable, we're asking the question, 
what is the relationship between active support measure scores and levels of engagement? So we find that when staff deliver higher quality support, then people are engaged more. It's a pretty consistent finding that we've across different studies in the UK, in Australia. So I'll sort of repeat that again to make it a bit clear. If staff are providing good active support or there's high scores on the active support measure, then we see higher levels of engagement. The other main question that the ASM has been used to address is as a dependent variable. So here we're asking what factors are associated with better quality active support. So this way active support is a predictor, oh, sorry, the, the outcome thing. We're trying to find out what are the things or the predictors that contribute to staff providing good support. And what we find more often, uh, sorry, what we consistently find across studies is that higher levels of adaptive behavior of the people supported results in better quality support. So in essence, that means that typically staff provide better support to people with mild and moderate intellectual disabilities compared to what they do with severe and profound, which we've quite known for some time, um, that staff training results in better quality active support, uh, better, stronger frontline practice leadership results in better quality active support. And another one that we found across several studies is that the culture dimension of supporting wellbeing, um, when there's a more positive culture in terms of uh, staff shared norms and patterns of behavior, then that also is um, contributing to better quality active support. So about the current study, um, there were two main rationales for uh, examining the active support measure. One is that in these previous studies using the ASM, that scores, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, the items have been interpreted as a single scale. So what that means is that the 15 items are then sort of added up together to produce a single score, which is a percentage, you know, the, um, usually 66% and above means good support below 33% poor support, but they treated as if they're one single construct of active support. And this has never been sort of tested or it hasn't been published whether it's been tested. So uh, the question is, does the ASM explore one underlying construct of active support or is there more than one dimension of support? And if so, what are they? So often when it comes to scale development that the researchers will conduct factor analysis to sort of determine um, whether it's one scale or multiple scales, um, but to our knowledge, this hadn't been done and it hadn't been um, published with, if, if it had been done. So that was the, the real sort of rationale uh, for the study was to test this assumption that it's a single construct because that's how it's been used in previous studies. And the other reason was because not all items are regularly observed and rated. So when we conduct uh, observations and complete the ASM, we find that three items are typically not seen. So one is staff managed serious challenge behavior. So we often don't see serious challenge behavior when we're conducting observations. Another item is differential reinforcement of adaptive behavior. Uh, again, I think you can see how behavior theory has influenced the uh, terminology of that item, but again, we don't see that too often. This is similar to um, challenge behavior, it's sort of like about maladaptive behavior. And then the third item that we rarely see is written plans in routine use. So with that in mind, uh, we conduct, we wanted to conduct an analysis of the ASM. And to do this, um, we drew on data that have been collected as part of the longitudinal study that's been done here at Leeds since 2009. So for this analysis, we use data from 2009 to uh, 2019 from 16 organizations. I'm sure as lots of people are aware, um, this study has involved multiple or many organizations in Australia, this longitudinal study into active support and practice leadership um, across different states. And it feels like it's still growing each year in terms of the organizations that participate. Um, so across these years, some organizations have been in the study the whole time. Others had come in at some point and left or they've later, uh, later in the study joined um, on average, um, 
in terms of the services, how many people? There were four to five people observed in each service with two staff on shift. So in this database, to begin with, there were 1,700, sorry, 1,713 observations. Um, so we had to clean that data set because we needed independent data points. What that means is that we couldn't have people in the sample more than once. So if in, let's say, for example, in 2012, we had been to one service and collected data of a particular individual, then we went back in 2013. And if they were in that sample again, we had to take them out. It could only appear once because we couldn't have dependency when we did our analysis. So after all that cleaning, um, we had a final sample size of 884 individuals with intellectual disabilities living in 236 accommodation services. Um, just some information there about participate, participants on average, they were 46 years of age, uh, most were male, 55%. And then in terms of their levels of adaptive behavior, um, the score was 148, which means on the more severe side of intellectual disability, but there was a big range. You know, there were people with mild, moderate, um, severe and profound uh, in this sample. Okay, so here's the very technical part of this presentation about multi-level exploratory factor analysis. Um, so I'll do my best to try and explain this. So the aim of the study was to identify the constructs of the ASM. Um, other terms for constructs are factors, subscales, dimensions, you can use these terms interchangeably. Uh, so to do this, to sort of see what the underlying dimensions of the active support model were, we use exploratory factor analysis. So this is a stats analysis that's based on correlations. It looks at the correlations between the variables, but then it looks, the main thing it does, it looks for the patterns of these relationships among the variables. And these are the factors or the subscales. So with exploratory factor analysis, there's, uh, as a researcher, we have no preconceived ideas about how many constructs or dimensions there are. There's no preconceived ideas about which items belong together. Uh, that having those preconceived ideas is a different analysis that's called confirmatory factor analysis. Um, but we had to do what is called a multi-level exploratory factor analysis, which uh, is out of doubt the hardest stats analysis I've ever had to do. Um, so it's similar to exploratory factor analysis in that we're trying to find the constructs but it takes into consideration what's called dependency in the data. So um, in most of the services that we have data on, there's four or five people who live together, but they can't be treated as if they're all separate um, because there's similarities between them due to just living in the same accommodation services and receiving support from the same staff. So we had to kind of do a multi-level analysis because it takes this into consideration that people aren't independent. There is you know, if there's five people living together and they're receiving support from one support worker, there's, um, you know, they're more similar to each other than different. So we had to run a multi-level analysis, um, which conducts it at what's called the individual level and also at the service level. <laughs> that is getting very technical now. And if you're interested in this, I'll just point you to the paper because uh, the service level analysis is quite complicated. But for now, we're going to focus on the individual level. And what that means is the scores that each individual gets on the ASM. So um, that's how it was designed to use the ASM, that that uh, individual gets a score for them. And that's the level that this analysis has been done at. And that's how scores have been used in the past. I hope that wasn't too complicated, but if there's any questions at the end, maybe I can um, sort of explain that a little better. And to do all this, we used a program called M Plus, uh, which is a really excellent um, stats program that's designed to perform advanced statistics like multi-level modeling, multi-level factor analysis, um, confirmatory factor analysis, et cetera. Okay, so with that in mind, what did we find from this analysis? We found that the ASM um, comprises two dimensions of support. So it's not just the one dimension as it's been used in previous research. So we found that um, the first dimension of that the ASM measures, we called supporting engagement in activities. So if you look at that first table there, you can see that there's seven items that were grouped together. So these seven items, uh, we've said they're 
uh, reflect or they're measuring or tapping this construct of supporting engagement and activities. And while we say that, it's because um, what staff are doing is providing people with choice to engage in activities. They're providing them with task analysis, so breaking the activity into steps, and they're providing the great assistance um, for them to engage in the activity. So all these items, or in another way, ways of working are about how the support worker provides uh, support for the person to engage in activities. And then the second dimension that we came across or identified was interacting with the person. So if you look at those items, uh, there's sufficient staff contact. So that staff are um, providing the person with enough contact or the contact that they want. Uh, there's interpersonal warmth. So this is about the relationship between uh, the worker and the person supported that, uh, you know, it's a nice friendly interaction and that the support workers speech matches um, the developmental level of the client. So there's two dimensions of the active support measure and uh, they were sort of measuring distinct but related aspects of active support. And some of the key figures to look at here is in the loading column that all those values are greater than 0 0.40. So that sort of tells you the strength of the relationship of those items to the factor. And then the other main thing to look at is the model fits to statistics there. So these are different ways that we can see how well this model uh, is fitting the data. And um, for each of these things, it had a really good fit, which is not totally common when you run a, uh, this sort of analysis. Sometimes you might get one or two of these fit in uh, statistics that aren't telling you it's a good fit, but all of these told us it was a good fit. So it sort of confirmed to us that the ASM does in fact measure two constructs. And I'd run this analysis in lots of different ways and doing different uh, approaches of doing it. And I consistently came up with, or the results consistently told me that the ASM measures two dimensions of support and that these items are quite reliable. Okay, so what does this mean? So the, the main finding is that the ASM measures two constructs of active support rather than one. So as I said, the first one was supporting engagement activities. So this is about the way staff support a person to engage, that they're providing choice, that they're preparing the activity, task analysis, grade assistance. And then the other one was interacting with the person. So the way staff interact with the person, the communication, being warm and respectful, all those sorts of things. Um, I found this quote in the book by Mansell and Beetle Brown, which was really quite interesting uh, after doing this analysis and getting these results. And they said, in the absence of good interpersonal relations, it is likely that the technical aspects of support will be delivered effect effectively. So even back in 2012, they sort of realized this relationship between good interpersonal relations and the technical aspects of support that you you need both for good support. So that's sort of what this research confirms that both technical and interpersonal support skills comprise good support. I'll talk a little bit about that and the implications in a minute. And first, I just wanna talk about the three items that were removed through the process of the factor analysis. So 12 of the 15 items were retained, but three of them were removed due to much uh, missing data or very low factor loadings, meaning not strong relationships. And these were the same three items that I identified earlier that had been problematic, that we hadn't been seeing them very often when we conduct observations. Um, so in terms of serious challenge behavior, these are rarely seen during observations. Like in 97% of the 884 observations, we do not see serious challenge behavior. And this isn't just a problem or an issue that uh, exists in our data set. This has been known for quite some time and in other researchers have uh, commented on this. In fact, Mansell said in 2001, which probably sort of explains why we don't see it too often in observations, is that serious challenge behavior is a low frequency behavior of short duration. So it doesn't happen all the time. Um, and if it, when it does happen, it's sort of a bit of an outburst and then it, stops. So, you know, we're not, we're not seeing it too much. Another one that we're not seeing is differential reinforcement of other behavior. So this is about how staff respond to maladaptive and adaptive behavior uh, with a 
it's quite a complicated um, sort of idea, but we're not seeing that in 86% of the observations either. This is, you know, when if someone's doing some sort of self-stimulatory or repetitive behaviours, you know, how are staff responding to it? It's kind of not something that I don't think most people sort of learn and know about these days. And then the other item which has been removed following this analysis, written plans in return, sorry, in routine use. And that's because we rarely see staff referring to plans during observations. They weren't seen in 92% of our observations, which in some ways makes sense because active support training since the development of the ASM, particularly the CISAR Center approach to training and our approach has placed less emphasis on written plans. Again, active support is more about the support that staff provide in the moment rather than uh, having written plans about it and referring to them and recording it and so forth. Okay, so what does this mean um, for practice and for research? So I think the key finding has been of this second dimension interacting with the person. And I don't think it's a totally new idea either. So uh, as you saw in that quote with Mansell and Beadle Brown, they sort of had recognized the importance of this second dimension interacting with the person. Uh, Hilary Johnson had done some work around this as well about the uh, that relationship and those types of interactions with the person. And I've written something about it as well in my conclusion uh, to my thesis. But I think what it has done is identified it much more clearly though, because we've got the evidence behind it, all these sort of observations and the stats have sort of really made it clear that yes, there's two clear components to good active support. There is um, the, the supporting engagement which in many ways reflects the four essentials of active support that I talked about earlier, um, you know, great assistance, choice, every moment's potential. And then there's this other dimension of interacting with the person. I think in terms of training and talking and thinking about support, we've put far more emphasis on the first dimension, supporting engagement activities. And, you know, and even in terms of coming up with the four essentials and even that diagram, this is where we've put our emphasis, but it seems that there's an opportunity to develop much further this second dimension of interacting with the person. And so we've got some of it on the website that we the training develop, uh, sorry, the website we developed with the training. There's some stuff around creating a friendly atmosphere and communicating, but it feels like it could be uh, even further developed than um, what we've done so far. Uh, in terms of implications for research, uh, we recommend that, uh, that this 12 item ASM be used so removing those three items and then treating them as two subscales. So adding up for the two subscales and using analysis as if they're separate rather than having this sort of single score. Um, so in terms of further research, then now that we've got these two dimensions, it would be good to sort of test the associations between these two subscales and levels of engagement, which we've started to do. So I'll sort of show some of our preliminary results looking into this. So I did this analysis at the end of last year using data that we collected in 2022 and 2023. So there were data from 255 people across 94 accommodation services and we used multi-level modeling. So here's what we found, that the first dimension supporting engagement in activities is associated, significantly associated with non-social engagement. So what that means when staff are doing the things like task analysis and grade assistance and all those things well, that, yeah, we do see that people are engaged more in uh, household activities, leisure activities, uh, personal care activities. And then we found that the second dimension, interacting with the person, so how staff talk and listen and communicate, um, is associated with how much people are engaged in social uh, uh, activities. So. Um, yeah, at the moment, it's sort of fitting with the hypothesis that uh, these two dimensions are associated with uh, people's engagement, but it splits them out into uh, people engaged in social and non-social engagement. Um, just to sort of finish up, I'm sure some people out there have heard about that there's a tool that we've developed here at LIDS. Um, there's a sort of a... a it's sort of still in production. It's hopefully not too far away now, but we've developed a observational tool to be used by staff who work in services. So particularly practice leaders and people who work in um, quality assurance. And there's a sort of a 
a picture that reflects how that looks. It's been, the items have been developed, expect reviewed and the yeah, apps tested. And then, uh, yeah, finally, the results of this study have been, uh, they're currently in press, I emailed them today. And uh, it seems uh, it's not too far away, but hopefully by the end of February, this um, study is published on the Journal of Intellectual Disability Research. So uh, thank you very much. I shall stop there. Thank you, Lincoln. That was um, that was a lot. That was very, very, very helpful. Our next seminar is the 10th of March, I think. <clears throat> and uh, Chris Bigby and I will be presenting um, separate papers that relate to um, the Disability Royal Commission.